Welcome everyone to the March Astrophotography SIG meeting of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. For all of our guests joining us here tonight, my name is Richard Bell. I am the president of the Kalamazoo Astronomical Society. And it is again, great to have you all here today. We of course have many members of the KAS, uh, many members from the public, especially those currently taking the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series. So many people call the lecture series a class, so you can consider this uh, extra credit for the uh, lecture series, even though you, you'll get the same grade one way or the other. So I'm uh, pleased to welcome a very special guest tonight, but first, just a little bit of a setup, because um, almost all guest speakers have joined us in person in Kalamazoo, or online from some, somewhere in the US. I believe we had at least one speaker that joined us live from Canada, but that's still North America. Tonight's guest speaker is a fellow amateur astronomer and astrophotographer joining us live from Cyprus. So uh, not quite halfway around the world, but pretty close. And of course, we're starting at just a little after eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time for him, the local time is 3 a.m., so we want to give him a very special thank you uh, for joining us at this hour. But of course, he is an amateur astronomer, so, you know, for, for us, it's early. So active in the field of practical astronomy and astrophotography from a very young age, he quickly found great joy in observing with the telescope and imaging especially, as the latter offers the ability to share one's views and inspire the next person to look up. Although the solar system and the planets in particular are his main interest, he engages in all types of imaging and celestial photography. During the day and night, he works as an astronomy guide for the, uh, uh, the COSA-based Astronomical Observatory and also takes part in various astronomy-related projects as an advisor researcher. He also takes part in various professional amateur collaboration projects, such as NASA's JunoCam project and the Planetary Impact Flash Detection Project, DETECT. So please welcome Agapios Elias. Thank you so much for that. We can get going. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, and uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about planetary imaging, uh, which is my main interest for quite a few years now. Um, I'm just going to get going here, share my screen. Okay. Hope you see that. So the topic of the talk is planetary imaging tools, methods, and results. And I'm just going to go through um, the basic principles of planet imaging and how it differs to traditional photography. Uh, we're going to look at some software that we use. Um, we're going to go through some methods. And at the end, we're going to share some results. Uh, so uh, I'm coming to you tonight from Cyprus, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea, um, somewhere there, a tiny island, but a beautiful island. Uh, it's actually uh, ideal if you want to do astronomy because almost always we have great weather. Um, we have a very large number of clear nights, um, and also we have uh, dark skies nearby, so you can find yourself in really dark skies, uh, just a short drive away, 45 minutes or an hour, and you're in uh, really, really dark and clear skies. Uh, the climate here is very mild. Winters are not too aggressive. We get hot summers, but the best part about it is that you can plan observing or imaging almost all the time, even in the winter, because uh, we have uh, really good weather. Uh, th this is not bragging, it's, it's the truth about the climate in Cyprus. It's just an ideal place to do astronomy. And I'm very 
fortunate to to live here and to have the ability to do what I love. Um, so this is pretty much the worst possible spot to do planetary imaging for reasons that I will explain a little bit. And that's where I live. So uh, I couldn't be in a worst possible place to do this kind of imaging on this island. But even so, uh, I've been able to get really decent results and uh, fine tune the craft uh, so that I can get consistent results with really modest equipment. So planetary imaging uh, in principle is uh, the concept of capturing and processing uh, images of the planets. Um, in principle is very different to traditional photography uh, and even uh, it differs quite a lot to typical nighttime astrophotography, um, but it's really easy to, for somebody to get going. You don't really need advanced equipment to, to, to start and get into it. Um, and another thing that's really uh, great about it is that results are almost immediate. Uh, this extends also to lunar imaging because the method is more or less the same. There's very little difference between lunar imaging and high resolution planetary imaging. Uh, the process is nearly identical. Again, not, no, no special requirements and you're up and running and you're getting results the same night. So as for tools, um, typically any kind of telescope uh, will do as long as uh, it has a fairly generous aperture. I've seen results, uh, really good results with uh, telescopes as small as a four inch, but Generally, the recommended size for somebody to get up and going with planetary imaging is something over the six inch mark. Uh, a typical eight inch C8 or whatever will do nicely. Uh, my weapon of choice for the past 12, 13 years has been the nine and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain, which is a very popular optical tool for um, this type of imaging. It, it, it's got uh, a massive following. A lot of people have used this telescope and gotten really great images with it. And um, it, it's a very uh, easy telescope to live with. Uh, you also need to have a, a reasonably good uh, mount with the ability to track and, and, you know, just keep the planet in the center of the field of view. Um, you need to have a relatively good and current uh, planetary imaging camera, uh, a bonus, obviously, and uh, at least a, an infrared blocking filter. And, and these are the, uh, the tools that I use personally. I have the Celestron Ultima, which is a very old um, apochromatic Barlow lens, but a really good one. Um, I'm using an infrared blocking filter from Astronomic, and I, I still use the ASI24, even though I've tried almost all of them. Uh, all of the planetary cameras that came after this one, I haven't really found uh, a reason to, to upgrade, even though this one has been out now for about seven years. So it's still a very capable camera and it's putting out really, really good results. Now, you don't absolutely need to have uh, a planetary imaging camera to do this kind of imaging. You can do it even with a DSLR, as long as you can get it to run in video mode and you can extract um, video from the DSLR and, and going to processing with it. So to talk a little bit about the camera, um, the uh, original um, planetary images camera back in, you know, the early 2000s when planetary imaging was really taking off uh, was a, uh, a typical computer webcam, um, the Philips Vesta, I think it was called. Then it turned into a to cam, then into this model that you see on the screen now, the SPC 900. And this was a, a, a typical uh, USB webcam. It had a tiny sensor and it could record uncompressed video at about 10 frames per second. And then uh, slowly once, you know, more and more people were getting into planetary imaging and putting out really good results, 
couple other companies came on the scene and brought out some really good cameras that could do maybe 30 or 60 frames per second. Um, but they were really, really expensive. And somewhere around 2010, 2012, ZWO came out with the original 120, which could do uh, 60 or 120 frames per second. And now to compare, the 224 can do more than 300 frames per second. So it's a really, really fast camera. There's, there's no comparison between the, the the capture speed of the modern dedicated planetary imaging camera and the original webcam. Even though uh, with the proper method and you know a little bit of care and processing, you could uh, capture really good results even with uh, a lowly webcam. Probably the most important accessory um, is the atmospheric dispersion corrector. This is something that I consider to be paramount. Uh, you absolutely need to have an atmospheric dispersion corrector if you're serious about uh, planetary imaging or observing. Um, you can use this both visually as well as uh, for uh, capturing images. It is a lifesaver. It has been a lifesaver over the past few years when the planets have been, you know, transiting really low in the sky. For my latitude, uh, I've had Jupiter and Saturn at about 30 to 40 degrees maximum altitude. And I got uh, Mars in 2020 up to 60, but even at 60 degrees, um, the, uh, the need for atmospheric dispersion factor was evident. So, what this does is, um, we all know that the, the atmosphere uh, surrounding our planet acts like a prism and it uh, bends the light and it causes uh, atmospheric dispersion, which is uh, an intense discoloration of, of the images. Um, it's generally considered to be a noticeable problem uh, if you're below, if you're imaging or observing below 45 degrees, but you can see it even higher than that. Um, some other um, astrophotographers have been uh, commenting on how they've been able to detect atmospheric dispersion as high as 70 or even 80 degrees, so almost at the zenith. But typically, it's uh, it starts to become really apparent uh, and difficult to deal with uh, if you're below 45 degrees. It has a similar appearance to the false color but it's something completely different. It's coming from the atmosphere and the, the way to address it and, and work around it is by using atmospheric dispersion corrector, which used to be a really expensive and premium accessory uh, before you know, the, uh, uh, the Asian companies sort of took over and started coming out with, um, you know, more budget-friendly uh, versions of, of, of this accessory. So in principle, um, what this is, is um, it contains two prisms, which are um, sort of triangular shaped, and they are um, set uh, with their flat sides joined to one another. And by adjusting their orientation and their uh, their orientation to each other, as well as the, their orientation compared to the local horizon, you can address the effect of atmospheric dispersion. And the improvement is immediately noticeable. Uh, it, it, is, it is staggering to, to witness the change in image quality by using one of these. And uh, you, you pick it up immediately just by looking at the screen or looking through the um, through the eyepiece when you're adjusting this uh, the accessory the the improvement is, is phenomenal it's an, an absolutely critical um, accessory to have another really really important uh, factor when it comes to uh, planetary imaging is making absolutely sure that your telescope is perfectly collimated. Um, the effect of miscollimation is, is really severe when you get into high resolution imaging. 
Um, and um, I'm sorry to say that most people either don't bother to, you know, spend the time to learn uh, what collimation really is and how to go about adjusting it, or maybe they're, you know, apprehensive about adjusting the optics of their telescope. But uh, I, I feel like if we were talking about musical instruments, you wouldn't use a musical instrument that was out of tune. So in the same way, you shouldn't be using your telescope if, if, if it's not collimated. And if you really want to get the most out of it, um, when, uh, you know, all the other factors come into play, um, you have a good optical tube assembly, you have a great mount, you have a really good camera, you're ready to go, you have good weather conditions. If you're not collimated, then you're not getting the most out of your, uh, out of your system. So it's absolutely paramount that you master collimation. Um, there's all kinds of um, methods and tutorials and, and even tools on, on how to uh, go about collimating. And uh, I've said this many times before, I've, I've tried pretty much everything and, and the, the absolute best um, tool that I've found is the software, uh, freeware. It's called MetaGuide. Um, it uses uh, the video coming from your uh, from your camera as you're aiming at a at a relatively bright star, and it and it can address it can evaluate um, the miscollimation present in your telescope, and it can sort of point the way towards how to adjust your secondary mirror so that you get perfect collimation, and and this works. Uh, amazingly well. It, it has been super precise um, and absolutely reliable as a tool. Um, you know, when when you get out there at three in the morning, four in the morning, the last thing you want to do is lose time because you're fiddling with, uh, you know, bending down over under the telescope, looking up through the focuser, trying to judge, uh, you know, what you're seeing. Uh, it, it's nice to have a tool that can do this for you with precision. And uh, this software has really been, you know, an incredible help for me personally uh, into, you know, learning uh, more about collimation and actually being able to adjust my telescope perfectly every time. Um, so I highly, highly recommend that you look into this software, download the software, play with it. Um, and it, uh, you know, uh, it, for me, it has been an incredible help. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, if you spend some time with it, uh, it, it will help you too. Um, typically, the planetary imagers software suit consists of, um, you know, the usual suspects. Uh, we use fire capture to control the camera and capture the images, uh, auto stacker to go through uh, frame alignment and stacking and sorting. Um, Registax, uh, of course, for its um, irreplaceable uh, sharpening tools, uh, the wavelets, and uh, WinJupos for combining um, the stacked images we get. And then Photoshop or any other um, image editing software that you like for the final sort of cosmetic um, alterations to the image. Uh, all of them, all of these are free except for Photoshop, of course. But, um, you know, and this is the great thing about um, the astrophotography community and especially the planetary astrophotography community because every single one of these software is incredible and really powerful and and they're all free so kudos to everybody who's gone into developing uh, all of these uh, um, they really are incredible pieces of software so uh, the main difference between planetary imaging and typical photography or even uh, common uh, astrophotography is the way that the images are being captured. 
when you're using a camera, DSLR, or something similar, um, the principle of, 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 of getting rich is, you know, uh, you have a mechanical shutter, that shutter opens, uh, light comes in, uh, goes on the sensor and forms the image. And the, the brightness of, 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 the, of the image on the sensor and the way that the image will be formed depends on um, the speed of, of the opening and closing action of the shutter. Uh, in planetary imaging, uh, we don't use still frames. We use, uh, we're capturing videos and we use really fast exposure times. These really fast exposure times result in many, many hundreds and thousands of uh, individual images and many hundreds of them being captured every second. Uh, I often get asked, why do I not use like, you know, the latest, greatest BSLR for, for this type of imaging? And the reason is because unless you're talking about capturing videos through that BSLR, using the full sensor of that DSLR and using that mechanical shutter, you're not going to get anything more than 10, 15. I think last I checked, the fastest uh, mechanical shutter on a DSLR is 15 frames a second. Uh, that's nothing by today's standards when it comes to planetary imaging. Uh, you want to go faster than that. Um, so for planetary imaging, we capture uh, with a very high frame rate and the individual exposures, the individual files that we capture are time limited because of the rotation uh, of the targets. So when you're talking for a planet like Jupiter, it's advisable not to uh, expose, uh, not to capture video for longer than roughly a year and a half, um, maybe even two minutes. The stacking software can correct some of that rotation that will be captured. But of course, this is this is system dependent. So depending on the resolution of your telescope, you may have less than that or more than that. I've settled at capturing roughly a minute for uh, Jupiter and two, two and a half minutes for Saturn with my telescope, with the nine and a quarter. Uh, and and the, the basic way of going about capturing uh, is you just look at the screen and you try to judge when you have better conditions, better seeing conditions to begin your captures. And this is called lucky imaging. Uh, you just, you wait for conditions to improve and you click the capture uh, key and you gather your data and you hope that within that capture you have some good frames. So uh, as I said, AutoStacker or any other stacking software can uh, essentially sort all of those frames coming in and it can evaluate them and grade them and trim the file based on the quality of the frames. And the bad frames can be discarded and, and not be used. So uh, let's say, for example, you've captured a file containing a thousand frames or a hundred frames. Uh, not all of them will be uh, uh, good, will be usable. So with a software like AutoStacker, you can go through all of those individual frames, you can evaluate them and you can sort of select the better ones and discard the worst ones. And the better ones will then be stack, combined, stacked into uh, a single image containing all the information from all of those individual better frames. Uh, so using this method, uh, back in 2013, uh, just a single two minute video, um, I used an old imaging source uh, color camera for this, uh, a two minute file uh, running at 30 frames a second this resulted at 3,600 frames, and I've used about half of those 
So I ended up stacking about 1800 frames and then sharpening and processing to come up with the result. And this, I think this was probably the first time I really got to, you know, see the, the full power behind um, the uh, C9 and a quarter inch telescope, the resolution, the, the possible resolution of that telescope under good conditions and, and, and the power of, of, of the processing and stacking and um, in, in giving these, these images. And, and, you know, thankfully this image was um, published uh, in uh, uh, the British uh, magazine, the Astronomy Now. Um, I was really excited about that because uh, it was the first time that uh, a planetary image was, you know, photo of the month, full page. Uh, felt really proud about that. So um, this method um, can be extended much further with modern software uh, by using a modern uh, camera like the ASI224. You can uh, go up to speeds of 300 or more frames per second. Uh, this is 300 individual pictures in one second. It's vastly different to, you know, exposing for many minutes and gathering many hours worth of data as you would do in, in long exposure deep sky imaging. Everything is, is lightning fast in planetary imaging. And, you know, the faster you can, you can capture, typically the faster you do it, the better it will be because uh, you have more chances of, freezing the scene conditions and, and gathering more uh, good frames uh, within that short period of time when conditions are better. Um, one of the uh, most critical um, graphs in, in Eurostacker is the quality graph uh, that you see here. And, and I want to try to, you know, construct this and, and go through it a little bit so that you can get a much better idea of what exactly this graph is showing. So we have, we have three elements here. Uh, we have the, the grid, which is in the background. We have, uh, we have the pattern, the gray pattern in the middle, and we have the green curve in the front. So when we are capturing, when we're live out there in the field and we're capturing, what's happening is, it, you know, unless you, you live in, you know, a really exotic location and you happen to have superb scene conditions, uh, the average Joe doesn't, doesn't get that. Um, so what's happening is the frames being recorded coming in have a very random distribution of quality because obviously the atmosphere is shifting and it's turbulent. So quality differs dramatically between frames. So when you're recording and those frames are coming in, they have very different um, uh, quality between them. So what Autostacker can do is, as soon as you load the video uh, into Autostacker and you go through the process of uh, evaluating that video, it will go through all of those frames and it will detect the average quality of all frames and it will sort, it will come up with the graph showing you the difference from the average for each individual frame. This is what the gray pattern shows. Um, so the grid has, you know, uh, the, the high quality and low quality and first frame to the left and last frame to the right. So when the graph comes up, seen here, you can see how each frame differs from the, from the, from the average. So obviously, before doing anything to the video, 
the quality is random. So the first frame may be really poor, the second may be average, the third will be a little bit better, the fourth will be really good, and so on and so on. So everything is random. Once AutoStacker goes through the evaluation process and comes back with the sorted, um, sorted file, the curve will represent the quality of the frames as they have been sorted. So all of the good frames will be in the front and all of the bad frames will be in the back at the end of the video. And by selecting a percentage or a number of frames, you can discard whatever percentage of that file you want and you can keep the absolute best. Now, here's where shooting at high frames per second comes in handy because the, the faster you shoot, the more frames you can keep, you can be more strict with your selection process and you can end up having more frames. So here's a little visual to try to put this into perspective. So the frames coming in uh, by default have a very random distribution of quality. Going through AutoStacker, they will be aligned to each other and they will be sorted by quality. So the best ones will be in the front and the, the worst ones will be left in the back. And then we can choose how much uh, of that video we want to keep. And we are going to concentrate on keeping uh, the absolute best. Um, a common suggestion is to try to shoot for about half of your uh, overall capture. But I would dare to say uh, if, if you shoot at a very high frame per second, you can, you can be more strict. You can, I typically go for 10, 15%. And because I use a very high frame rate, that still ends up with quite a significant number of frames that I can then go on and, and, and you know, further process and sharpen without having too much trouble with noise. So the reason for um, all of this process is, of course, the fact that we live on a planet with an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is, you know, this really thick layer of, of, of vapor and, and gas and it's separated into all kinds of different layers with different behaviors, different speeds, different temperatures. I like to think of the layers of the atmosphere as bodies of water. So if you've ever uh, stood above a swimming pool and you tried to see uh, you know, what's on the bottom of the swimming pool, if there's nobody swimming and the water is calm, you can pretty much see everything that's going on. But if you have, you know, people swimming in the swimming pool, water is, is turbulent, obviously you won't be able to see anything. So try to imagine that the atmosphere has, you know, multiple layers or multiple swimming pools filled with people <laughs> above you. So there's all kinds of movement going on above us. So we have to be able to peer through all those layers to get to our target and gather um, good images. Um, for my location, even though it's an island, it's not, you know, it's not an exotic uh, island with superb seeing, although there are places on the island with really good conditions. Typically, the seeing is the average, I would say. Um, and, and this image here shows the difference uh, in quality between two consecutive videos. So I was actually, uh, we're showing one minute videos and uh, at 11.54, I had a, a fair sort of quality image coming out. And just a minute later, the scene conditions were so much different. I wasn't able to get much detail out of that. The key here is that looking at the live feed, both of these looked identical. 
So I was not able to discern just by looking at the live feed if I was going to get a good image or a bad image. And the reason for that is because when you're looking at the live feed as you're recording, uh, at least with Fire Capture, Fire Capture can display the live feed at the same rate as it's being captured. So if I'm shooting at 200 frames per second, the, uh, the preview is also being played at 200 frames per second. Now, I don't know if, if our brains can keep up with that and, and distinguish between 200 frames in a second. Uh, so my point is, you could be having better seeing than what you think just by looking. So the process of just randomly sitting there and waiting for when you think things look better on the live screen to hit record is, to me, is nonsensical. So what I've settled on to doing is using um, a slightly different method uh, which uses, uh, sorry, which uses consecutive uh, continuous videos. I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. Um, so uh, we've talked about the atmosphere uh, and the seeing conditions and, you know, there's all kinds of sources and, and you know, websites that you can refer to um, to help you, you know, uh, get a, prediction or an understanding of the scene conditions. Um, I've settled on using this website, uh, windy.com. Um, it, it, it's got a really thorough, um, uh, you know, prediction model for uh, the winds, which is what affects, what, what mostly affects uh, the scene conditions. And to put it simply, at least for my location, um, what needs to happen for me to get good scene is the uh, the wind needs to be you know sort of coming at me uh, at roughly the same direction across all of those layers. So, for example, uh, there's about six or seven layers, individual layers. Uh, uh, in the atmosphere and the wind within those layers is different. When the wind inside those layers is coming at me at roughly the same direction, uh, seeing is almost always better. And uh, I have a little graph here uh, to better visualize that. So let's say that you have winds coming at you from the north, the northwest and the west, which is these directions are spread across a quarter of, of you know, of the 360 degrees. Um, this usually results in fair seeing conditions, not the best, but not unusable. Uh, when you have winds coming at you from opposing layers, uh, that's when things are terrible. That's when uh, the seeing is, is, you know, the worst. And obviously, whenever uh, those winds come at you from the same direction, for my location, this happens to be the Northwest because of the local geography. Um, but whenever that happens, uh, even if the speed across all of those layers is different, seeing is almost always better. And uh, what's, you know, um, uh, the uh, the golden indicator of you know good seeing uh, is almost always um, the increased humidity. So whenever uh, you notice uh, fog or you know um, increased uh, humidity in the atmosphere, that's when uh, conditions are more favorable for uh, observing and imaging the planets. Uh, another tool that I use is uh, this website, Meteo Blue. Uh, it's got a section on astronomical seeing. Um, I'm not sure if it applies to North America. 
I think it does. But um, at least for me and, and you know, for, for uh, some of my European colleagues, uh, this has been an indispensable tool because it gives you, you know, sort of a, a quick glance um, with a quick glance being able to, you know, uh, know what to expect. And uh, it, it's really thorough. Um, you have information about the cloud cover, low level, mid level, high level clouds. You have an estimation on the predicted uh, scene resolution, um, the jet stream speed, as well as temperature and humidity and some other information. So this is, you know, the quickest way for uh, me to, you know, just look at the a prediction and, and know if the night is, is worthwhile before I go out. Um, So um, going into um, actually capturing images, uh, I'll just switch to uh, a new uh, fire capture. Let's see if I can, oh, there we go. So this is, um, this is the fire capture software. Uh, it's not the latest version, but uh, for um, the purposes of, uh, you know, uh, demonstration. It, it's um, it's got pretty much everything you need to control uh, your camera and capture images. I, I, I have a little uh, ASI camera here with me um, to to illustrate some of the of the features. So you can control uh, through the software. You can control um, how much of the actual sensor you want to use, whether you want to use the entirety of, of the sensor or if you want to concentrate on a smaller region by using the region of interest feature, uh, which you know is a really powerful uh, feature and a really handy uh, way to increase your um, shooting speed, your frames per second, because obviously when you're shooting at full frame, um, you're not going to be getting uh, quite the speed that you would if you're only using a smaller part of the sensor uh, because, you know, the system is downloading a much smaller image so it can download faster. So um, for uh, imaging the planets, you don't really need um, the full extent of, of the sensor. You can just click and drag and, you know, draw a small box around your target and, you know, the software will ignore everything else and just concentrate on that and just capture on through that uh, small box. And this will dramatically increase uh, the download speed. Um, so yeah, through Fire Capture, we can control, you know, the basic features of the camera, such as, you know, the gain, the exposure. Um, you can have preset capture settings for uh, different targets depending on your system. So you can, you know, you can go out one night and sort of judge how, um, you know, uh, how much gain you need, how much exposure you need for Jupiter, or for Mars, or for the moon, or whatever. And the system will remember that, and it's really, you know, really handy. Um, you have, uh, you know, uh, tools here for looking at the live histogram uh, and all kinds of um, add-ons uh, that are really, really helpful. And probably the the best one uh, would be. Uh, the atmospheric dispersion corrector uh, setting tool, which is this one. Uh, we won't be able to see it in, in action now, but the principle of, of this tool is that it allows you to um, more accurately judge the, uh, the extent of the atmospheric dispersion uh, coming uh, from your system. And it gives you you know, by using um, these two circles, it gives you the ability to, you know, fine tune 
um, the setting of the dispersion corrector so that you're, you're at maximum possible correction. It works really, really well. It's really handy. Um, and uh, I, I highly recommend that you use this um, if you're using atmospheric dispersion corrector. Uh, some people, you know, uh, they judge uh, the correction of the dispersion corrector visually by, you know, using an eyepiece and, and uh, setting the, uh, uh, working the adjustments until uh, the image appears um, dispersion free, but uh, obviously using a tool is much more precise. Um, uh, another really important feature uh, in fire capture is the ability to uh, program uh, your captures. Uh, let me see if I can, I can show that. Uh, there's this tool here, which is the, the auto run feature. And you can sort of use this to capture long sequences of, uh, of files. And this is really handy if you want to go into uh, using WinJupos for derotation. Um, because with this tool, you can, you know, you can instruct the software to capture 10, 20, 30, 50, whatever number of consecutive uh, files using uh, identical settings. And then you can batch process all of those with AutoStacker and Registax and load those into WinJupos um, and uh, go through derotation. Um, okay, so to better illustrate that. So here's um, a visual to uh, try to communicate the, 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 the point of sequential captures. Um, uh, if you remember, I, I showed you a frame before where uh, we had two consecutive shots of Jupiter and they were massively different between them. Um, by, you, by shooting consecutively, you have the ability to sort of, it's almost like fishing with a net. Uh, you're assured that whatever better conditions will happen when you're out there uh, within the time frame that you're capturing, you will have certainly captured them uh, because you're not relying on your own judgment just by looking at the screen uh, to you know judge when things look better. Uh, you've asked the software to you know capture a large number of consecutive video files. And then by going through uh, those files in AutoStacker, you can produce a, um, a, a folder where all of those files would be uh, identically stacked. And with Registax, you can use um, the scheme feature to identically process all of those stacks and what's left is a folder where the only thing that's different between the captures is the same. You didn't change any settings, you, you didn't change anything in the processing phase, so the only variable is the scene condition and it, and it just makes it so easy to you know capture for a very large period of time, typically I typically go for about two hours, maybe three, depending on the night. Obviously, this is going to result in a massive, massive amount of data. Um, I'm used to capturing about three, four hundred gigabytes of data every night uh, with this method. Um, but it's it almost certainly guarantees that you're going to capture uh, the best conditions uh, that will have happened within that time frame that you're out. Uh, and then obviously it, it's incredibly easy to just uh, isolate those better uh, conditions, those better files and use just those and 
put everything in into Wing Ju Boss and combine them, sort of stack the stacks together and produce a final uh, high signal to, to noise ratio image. Um, sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, process visualized. On the left, we have an individual um, uh, stack, um, say a one, two minute file uh, as it's coming out of AutoStacker. In the middle is just that one file sharpened in Registack, uh, sort of using the lucky imaging method. So that's just one uh, file. And on the far right, we have the combination of multiple of those um, individual files combined together and sharpened. And obviously you can see uh, noise is almost completely eliminated. And uh, it, it's overall a much, much more, um, much cleaner image. And time for some results. Um, this is uh, Jupiter with the Great Red Spot and the Moon Callisto. Uh, you can see some, some surface detail on Callisto, uh, quite a lot of detail in the Great Red Spot and in the uh, multiple bands of Jupiter. So this was 11 one minute files combined together. Uh, shot at 163 frames per second. This resulted in uh, 9,800 frames per video. And those were trimmed at 24%. So I kept just the 24% uh, better frames of those 9,800. And the total frames stacked into this image were 25,000. Um, another result on Jupiter, uh, sort of showing the rotation of the planet. Uh, five one minute files shot at 200 frames a second, uh, 15,000 frames for each one of these images. Uh, all of these are with the nine and a quarter and the 224. Uh, another Jupiter with uh, Callisto and Ganymede, again showing. Uh, some surface details. Uh, this was a long one. This was 22 minutes. So 22 uh, one minute files, uh, 12,000 frames for each one and a total of 66,000 frames. Uh, Saturn, notoriously difficult to capture and process, especially for um, a smaller telescope, um, a really, really difficult uh, target. It's taken me years to get uh, an image of Saturn that I considered, you know, good. Uh, this was 44 two minute files done at 70 frames per second for a total of 62,000 frames. Uh, Mars. 14 minute and a half um, uh, files, 248 frames per second. Good thing about Mars is that it's really bright and it's really small. So you can use a very, very small box in fire capture and you know the FPS just shoots up. I've been able to capture Mars at more than 300 frames per second. That will really fill up your hard drive really quickly. Uh, 40,000 frames in total for, for this image. Uh, another Mars, this is a time-lapse. Uh, this, this is 149 consecutive one minute files played back uh, identically sharpened into a time-lapse. Uh, this, the, this was the best night, uh, the best conditions uh, I've ever had. Uh, for as long as I've been doing planetary imaging. Uh, it was, this was the first time that I, you know, 
I was able to uh, capture over a, a really, really long period of time. I think this was more than three hours. I got somewhere around 600 gigabytes just imaging Mars uh, at 266 frames per second. So this is 300,000 frames for this time lapse. Actually, more than 2 million if you account the discarded frames. So the, I captured more than 2 million frames to produce this time lapse. Uh, and Venus. Uh, another difficult target. Uh, this is a false color image uh, using a poor man's UV, uh, UV Venus filter uh, and uh, uh, an infrared filter to produce this uh, composite where you can just about make out some cloud structures on Venus. Uh, the moon, um, the moon uh, filled with individual craters and features. Uh, this is, you know, the crater Plato. You can see some uh, some of the uh, craterlets uh, on the main crater floor. Uh, I typically shoot about a thousand, uh, two thousand frames for the moon, and I typically use about a quarter of the total, so about about 500 frames um, for lunar imaging. Uh, but the, the difference in, in lunar imaging is that I typically also use uh, a near infrared filter. Um, for, for this example, I was using the uh, 610 a nanometer red filter, which you know it's is much less susceptible to seeing conditions and uh, really helps in in producing sharper images, even in in. Um, and this one, a mosaic of uh, the crater Plato and the Alpine Valley on the moon, the two images fused together. Um, the the bad thing about uh, using a uh, typical schmidt cassegrain uh, is that if you want to do lunar imaging, you have to learn to live with field curvature. So you can't really um, capture the entire uh, frame uh, uh, because, you know, there's significant field curvature. So the, the edges of the field are never uh, as sharp as the center of the field. Obviously not a problem if you're shooting planets, but it becomes evident if you're, if you're doing the moon. So that's about it. Um, I'm surprised that I remained alert and coherent throughout the whole thing. Thank you for your uh, patience. Um, if there are any questions, I'd, I'd love to, you know, answer them. Thank you very much. Yeah, we got plenty of time for questions. So uh, if anyone has any, fire away. Well, what equipment do you take with you when you go out into the field? You've got the camera, you've got the telescope. Uh, do, you do you need to take a uh, portable uh, uh, computer with you? Uh, what kind of lighting conditions do you have, et cetera? Well, Personally, I don't go out into the field for planetary imaging, uh, but if you would, uh, what you would absolutely need is uh, obviously you're going to need a laptop. Uh, you're almost certainly going to need an additional hard drive, something to power um, not only your, your, your mount, but mostly your computer. Um, and... Uh, yeah, um, that would be the, the basics. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I would, you know, make provisions for uh, combating uh, dew and humidity. So you would need dew shields or dew heaters. And, and if you're using dew heaters, um, you need, uh, I would recommend that you, you use a separate power source for those dew heaters 
so they don't drain your your, your main battery uh, if you're powering your mount and your computer for, from another source. So yeah, uh, but uh, I I don't do uh, uh, I don't go out to planetary. I I do uh, planetary from home. I yeah, well, I yeah I live in you know essentially in Chicago, and there's uh, you have to go quite a distance away, and I'm sure some of the other uh, uh, participants here uh, would also have to travel uh, quite a distance to get away from the uh, the light. Well, you don't need to get away from the lights. If, you, if, if you're doing planetary, uh, uh, you don't need to uh, get away from the lights. Uh, you know, uh, the plants are so bright that they're not affected by, by light pollution. So mm -hmm. there's no requirement for you to, uh, to, to go out. Uh, you can just, you know, stay home. Backyard photography. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, great. Thank you so much. You, I, this has been a wonderful program. You, you should be uh, very happy about uh, how you uh, convey your, your, your background and your knowledge. It, uh, it's very clear. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. What about if I'm using a Mac versus, mm. uh, like, are those available for Mac? <laughs> I've read somewhere that uh, Mac and astrophotography don't go together. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I think you can, there's a way you can um, sort of uh, import uh, Windows programs into Mac, into Macintosh, and you can use them. Uh, but um, I'm not the authority on this, so don't take my word for it. But um, I'm, I'm also pretty sure that there, there's at least one uh, planetary imaging software uh, for Mac. Thank you. Yeah, it's not as bad as it used to be. I can't name any off the top of my head, but 20 years ago, it was really bad. So that's what made me switch from Mac to PC. But yeah, there, there's programs out there. You just got to look for them. Yep. Any other questions? There's a question in the chat that uh, I saw that I thought I would get the um, talky questions first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope I was I was you know coherent uh, and articulate throughout the whole thing because um, you know it, that's four in the morning there now. <laughs> yeah, it's four in the morning. <laughs> What's the general guideline for using Barlow lenses with? For imaging, great question. So, um, for planetary imaging, um, the sort of rule of thumb is you want to take your focal ratio to about five times the pixel size of your camera. For example, the ASI 224 that I'm using has uh, 3.75 micron sized pixels. So five times that is roughly 19. So I need to be shooting at uh, f19 to get the maximum possible resolution from that camera. So I would need to use, so my, 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 my telescope is f10 natively. So I need to use a times two Barlow. So this is a, a very rough guideline. Um, you can obviously go a bit further or a bit lower from that, depending on your system and your local conditions, but take that as a, as, as a very rough um, uh, guideline. Okay, great, thank you. I have a 462 MC, so I'm just starting to get into planetary. Yep, I've got one too, but I haven't used it at all. Um, I, I've, I've been so happy with the 224. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just waiting for it to die before I replace <laughs> it for, with the yeah. 462. Yep. Great. Thank you. Well, doing like a million frames in one night is uh, pretty good. It's hanging in there. Oh, yeah. That's pretty impressive. I don't know if there's a way to, to you know, find out the total number of, of frames it's ever recorded. Uh, it would be a humongous number, I'm sure. It's got to be over 10 million, I'm sure. 
Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, uh, beneficial using an infrared filter, uh, particularly on the moon. Uh, would you also use the infrared when uh, doing uh, the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars? Uh, uh, specifically with the 224. Yeah, so the 224 being a color sensor, uh, what you need to use is an infrared blocking filter. Um, I use that, and that's what you, you, you need to be using. But for the moon, because uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to produce a color image of the moon. I have the ability to sort of um, bypass the color information and just keep the uh, near infrared information. So I use the filter and I produce a monochromatic image just by using the, uh, the infrared information coming on the sensor. All right. I don't know if that made sense. It, it does. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, one more Barlow question. I just did the math for my telescope and it comes out to be about like a Barlow lens for like 3.6. So mm -hmm. how do you get those off sizes? Do you like do extenders or just get what off? What telescope do you have? Uh, 12 inch F4. Oh, okay. So um, there's two ways to do that. Um, you either um, use extenders uh, if you're using a regular uh, non-telecentric type Bartle lens, mm -hmm. telecentric being uh, the power mate uh, mm -hmm. from Teleview. So those are telecentric. Uh, what this means is no matter how far back you go from the Barlow lens, the magnification factor doesn't change. Mm. So if you're not using one of those, if you're using a regular um, a Barlow lens, then the further back you go, you get more magnification factor. So you can use an extender and mm. sort of play with the different you know, combinations of extenders to, to get to where you want to be. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. So there is, um, so there's a times three, there's a times four, Four as well, mm -hmm. uh, so you could use you know a times four and, and you know experiment with that because that would be close enough. Yeah, see, so yeah, and based off of seeing how it goes. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions they want to ask? Okay, let's do the uh, uh, couple on the chat here. Let's see, we have uh, the first one is. Uh, how did you get started in astronomy and photography? Can you give us starter tips? Of course, you should take the introduction to amateur astronomy lecture series. That that helps. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, personally, um, I've been interested in uh, you know the night sky for as long as I can remember, um, but. I really started to warm up to uh, observing the planets as soon as I got my first telescope. Um, the second thing I saw was uh, Jupiter and Saturn following. So as soon as I got my first look on, on, on Jupiter and Saturn, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got my, my first digital camera, and, and I was able to, you know, record images of, of, of uh, the planets. Um, that was, you know, the defining moment. And that's when I sort of focused most of my uh, free time into doing planetary observing and imaging. Um, and I've, I've been uh, doing uh, this since 2005. So I started by using, you know, a uh, really, really old um, Intel Celeron uh, Windows XP uh, laptop with 40 gigabytes and uh, a, uh, a Philips webcam uh, doing 10 frames per second back in 2005. And then slowly, you know, upgrading and, you know, 
getting further into it and learning more things. Um, I've also been very fortunate to um, have an incredible, incredible, uh, probably the world's top planetary astrophotographer as as a mentor, uh, Damien Peach. Uh, if you, uh, most certainly, uh, if you've seen his photos or you know about it. Um, and I've been able to connect with him on a couple of occasions, and I was even able to do imaging with him uh, when he came here in Cyprus. And 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 just by uh, you know uh, following uh, his methodology and you know uh, uh, all the things that he was doing, I, I've learned so much. And uh, you know I highly recommend if you're interested in uh, high resolution planetary imaging. Uh, look up his website and his resources and his tutorials. Um, that will really get you going. All right. Let's see, the next question in the chat is for planetary. Is there any advantage to using a DSLR modified for astrophotography? No. <laughs> Absolutely no. Yeah. Um, no benefit whatsoever. Uh, the reason being. Uh, the main thing we want uh, when we're doing planetary imaging is being able to capture really, really quickly. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not like when you're doing deep sky imaging where you want to modify your sensor to better receive um, um, hydrogen alpha light and all of that. In, in planetary, all you want is to beat the atmosphere. And the best way to do that is by capturing many, 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 many frames in very short periods of time when um, the turbulence is, you know, sort of eased out a little bit and you can just go in with your camera and capture 200, 300 pictures in, in, a, in, a, in a second. Um, that, that's the main thing. So, uh, the answer will be no. <laughs> All right. The last one we have here is, do you, oh, shoot, someone just chatted. Do you use a computer like ASI Air or Nina while shooting, or is your camera connected straight to the laptop? Um, yeah. So these, uh, these cameras are typical USB cameras. So it's, it's connected straight onto the, uh, the laptop. Um, uh, there's nothing in between, uh, so it's a direct connection uh, to the actual uh, computer. You could use, um, uh, you know, uh, you could do this remotely if you wanted by using a, um, a, a mini computer attached to the, to, to the telescope and, and you logging into that remotely, but you would be limited uh, uh, by the, uh, you know, the, the specs, the performance, and the hard drive available, because uh, on my laptop, uh, I'm, uh, I have a, a one terabyte uh, hard drive, and I fill up more than half of that every night easily. So, uh, storage space is a major requirement, and, and, and um, if you do use um, a remote setup and, and you have like a mini PC controlling the telescope and the camera and, and all of that, you would need to have a lot of storage space for that. Okay, we also have, for doing extended consecutive captures, do you need to have some tracking tool to keep uh, the, the target in the area of interest in case you have uh, mountain tracking air. And the next question is related to that. Do you ever guide for planetary? So those two questions are kind of related. Yes and yes. Yeah. So uh, through fire capture, you can um, guide, uh, not in the sense uh, of, of, you know, PhD guiding where you have a separate uh, telescope looking at the star field and uh, issuing corrections for the mount. So fire capture can uh, send uh, nudges uh, to the mount to sort of bump the planet back into uh, the center. And remember, we don't really worry about 
mount performance when it comes to video captures of the planets because uh, obviously the capture speed is, is, is really, really fast. So even if during the capture the planet is sort of drifting in, uh, all around the field of view, as long as it doesn't leave the field of view, uh, it's not a concern. Uh, and you can guide through um, the fire capture software. In, in, in essence, guiding here is more like just bumping the mount left and right and up and down to just keep the, the plan in the center. But yeah, um, guiding is, 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 is done in, in planetary captures. All right, Can thank I, you. I, I, I have a repeat question. Sure. You mentioned your mentor, the man that uh, helped guide you along. What is his name again? And could you spell it? Uh, yeah, that would be Damien Peach. Uh, so it's D A M I A N and Peach as the fruit, P E A C H. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot. Yep. All right. Thank you, Agapios. This has really inspired me to take up planetary imaging for a while. I'm happy to say that I started doing planetary imaging with one of the little egg shaped two U cams back in like 2001. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then I uh, got an imaging source camera that I never used. Uh, but now that we have an upgraded observatory here in town, I'm going to uh, start heading out there a lot more often, uh, especially this summer, to do some solar and uh, planetary imaging. This has been a great help uh, to me to get back on the the uh, saddle as it is. So we want to thank well, you for joining us. Help. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely contact you if I need any pointers or any uh, um, processing help. We can we, we can do some uh, processing. I'll I'll try to do it at a time that's good for you, and uh, <laughs> I'll stay up I'll stay up late this time. So we want to uh, again uh, thank you for joining us, especially at uh, the ungodly hour you're up now. And I just want to end by uh, saying, get some sleep. <laughs> Thanks. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're certainly welcome to uh, stick with us, but uh, if you have to go and get some Z's, we certainly understand, but uh, let's go ahead and move on. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. My pleasure. Give him a round of applause there. Thanks. It's been great. That Thank was, you. That was fabulous. Was so <laughs> and I put together a lot of PowerPoints too, and that was a well-crafted PowerPoint as well. So I really give you kudos there as well. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, first up, anybody want to share any images from the past month? I know the weather's been pretty icky, but uh, does anyone have anything new to share or anything? I can share something. All right, Rick, go ahead. Um, I went out and took the uh, pictures of the planets that you could get um, at a certain point in time as the sun came up. And... Um, I'd be happy to share that. You should be able to share. Pull it up. I don't know how to share it on this Zoom. Um, it's actually in my um, in my background right now. If I get out of the picture, you could see it. Okay, I can. Uh, this... I can uh, make you a spotlight here if you. So if you want to duck out of the way, we can see it. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So um, I don't know what that this other thing is here, but anyway, and about the dead middle of that horizon um, there, where it goes into a little valley, that's yeah. where Mercury Mercury is sitting right in there, just above the horizon. Okay. And um, of course, the other ones, Mars and um, and Venus, are quite easy to see, um, but. Uh, I got up um, and uh, it was very interesting because I wasn't sure where um, Mercury was going to be or not. And then all of a sudden, there it was. I'm going, oh, yeah, that's why they say um, you got you would have been better off the day before because it would have come up uh, with not so much light. But I did get it. And uh, I was kind of pleased with that. I just used a wide angle lens on a standard camera. Where are you located? Pardon me? Where are you located? Oh, uh, I'm in California, um, up in the mountains. Uh, this was up about 3,000 feet. Um, and it was looking, um, of course, southeast. 
great. I don't know why you have the chair in the foreground. That's a weird artistic choice. But hey, that's okay. Well, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what that was. <laughs> All right, go back to gallery view there. All right, fabulous. Anybody else have any astrophotos? I know it has been a difficult month to do imaging around here, so I don't expect, I didn't expect too many. And of course, we don't have any from Michigan, just one from California. Uh, any interesting images from other astrophotographers? I did see the uh, fabulous image of the Heart Nebula that was on Astronomy Picture of the Day a few days ago. I don't know if anyone saw that. I did. It was great, yeah. Uh, I could probably find it here real quick. Uh, let's see. I did not pull it up ahead of time. So there's a great prominence uh, picture this week too, speaking of, speaking of uh, getting back in solar. Ah, here it is. Okay, so let's see. We'll go to share. And there it is. So this, of course, is the Heart Nebula in Cepheus. And it was taken by Adam Jensen. I think you can go to his Astro Bin page here somewhere, but I forget. And um, so this is probably one of the better heart images I've really seen. Of course, it was posted on uh, Valentine's Day, so that's very appropriate. And there have been some other ones uh, that have been also very great. There's uh, this uh, kind of HDR image. This is from... Um, I think images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, where they just look, where they just combine images along with Terminator. So that's a really unusual uh, look at the moon there. I really like this amateur view of this uh, prominence that someone took a time lapse of. So that's been really great. And then there was this one. This is from the uh, 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 Chile scope, which I believe Damien Peach uses for planetary imaging as well. But this is really remarkable work for dark nebulae. So yeah, th there, there's always great pictures on astronomy picture of the day. But uh, if anyone cap uh, caught any others they saw online, you can uh, share them here real quick. Nobody? All right, how about any new astrophotography related equipment software? Pete, do you want to talk about your new scope and do you have it set up yet? Yeah, I do have it set up. Um, I can actually share uh, inside of Let's get the inside FOSS my, cam. Yeah, there's the FOSS cam. It's in, it barely fits inside my dome right now. <laughs> it looks bent. <laughs> yeah, it's a, <laughs> a FOSS cam has a little bit of a correction. Yeah. yeah. It's a it's a 12 inch f4 Newtonian. It's one of the uh, I believe this was actually one of the um, the TPO model. I got it from a gentleman here in Michigan who was having a fire sale to finance a AP 1200 mount he found. So, um, but yeah, I got it. Uh, finally got it mounted and I had to get a lost bandy 24 inch dovetail plate to fit on the, it's riding on my 1100 uh, AP mount. So it's getting set up for uh, deep sky, but I definitely plan on doing planetary imaging with it. Um, been looking forward to that, getting sucking in more light than my little eight inch uh, RC. So, but that's that my- That would actually be a really good choice. Mm -hmm. Sorry to fudge in. Oh, uh, no. Uh, if, if you get that, you know, collimated and, and, and you know, lined up on uh, under good conditions, uh, that will be an amazing telescope to do planetary. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen there was another guy in Michigan who has a similar scope that does some really good work and has kind of inspired me to use this for uh, planetary. So I really do look forward to it. But yeah, and the what's, call what's the uh, focuser, Pete? Uh, that's a three inch focuser. It's the stock. It's a linear bearing focuser. It's a, it's humongous. It's some beastly thing, but I, I do have a um, electric focuser on there. Um, so hopefully I don't have to be out there creating heat currents and all that stuff to try to minimize, uh, you know, the seeing out there. Um, so based off of my experiments last year with imaging, I definitely started to get an idea on how to deal with uh, getting everything or the time of day and, you know, when not to shoot above my, the roof of my house is bad, that kind of stuff. So, but um, yeah, the collimation, that's going to be the biggest thing. It's a fairly fast scope. So I just got to deal with that. But, um, but it's collimated right now so far. I mean, for as long as I could deal with it for it, 
you know, 20 degrees out. It's very cold. And you're using the uh, paracor for coma correcting? Uh, yeah, I have the paracor for this configuration. I have another, I have a batter, uh, a batter uh, row corrector, which has a 94 millimeter back focus, um, which allow me to use my uh, Pegasus rotator. So I could use the rotator because otherwise it has a, most correct uh, coma correctors have a 55 millimeter and I can't put the filter wheel off axis guider and a rotator. That's just too much. And you know the camera, you know back focus. It's just too much. You can't correct at that point. So I needed. There's only like a couple of uh, um, correctors out there that will actually have something beyond 55. So I had to order one that's 94. And if that doesn't work, then I guess I'll sell my rotator and go <laughs> out there and rotate myself. But yeah, the Paracore is supposed to be the the best one. So out there. So it costs like five hundred dollars. That hurt. Mm. Anyway, so that's what I got for new equipment that will cause even more clouds. And uh, you said you plan on maybe putting a carbon fiber tube instead of the aluminum on there. Yeah. Well, this is a steel tube. I'm going to see how this goes um, because the the focuser rings or the tube rings I, I greatly expanded because the dovetail plate that comes with these stock are only like 12 inches. And this is a 24 inch dovetail. Um, and um, the back, uh, the tube side of the focuser is actually reinforced. So and if that doesn't work, I will get a carbon fiber tube. I mean, I'm just gonna see how it goes. But if it, if it can't hold collimation, um, I will, I'll just order a carbon fiber. I, I already sourced one out. It's like 850 bucks for this. <laughs> For the same size. The ching. Yeah, no, another one. But it looks pretty sweet. It's black. <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you keep the uh, uh, steel tube there, there, there's plenty of room for a big KS logo right there, Pete. Look, look, it looked pretty good. <laughs> I know. I, I, was, I was thinking that. Do we sell de decals that big? Yeah, we, we, can, we can start. We can start. Yeah, I, I would do that. Um, <laughs> but I'm a, uh, I'll see how it goes. I, I think with... Um, I think with the tube rings and stuff, I, I won't know until I actually get going. I have an auto corrector coming so I can test it at, I'm going to slew it around and see how the auto corrector does. Um, but I got to be hanging the same weight off of it, so. And I see Dave Wolf, sounds like he's still waiting for his uh, 14 inch uh, Schmidt, so that's too bad. Oh yeah. Any other uh, uh, new purchases or equipment releases out there in the general community anybody wanted to mention? I think it's been pretty quiet out there. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask a really stupid question? So sure. so you, so being in Michigan, obviously where it's really cold, how, how, do you, how do you protect your cameras, telescopes in the outdoor weather with it being so cold? Well, mine's out in a dome, so it's just protected from the snow. But the cold, I just leave it out there. It doesn't affect the, the cold. Doesn't. So the so oh, gotcha. So temperature doesn't affect doesn't affect anything. Mm -mm. Oh, that's okay. Cool. Yeah. No. For for an astrophysics mount, I think they tell you to contact them if it gets to like maybe what twenty below or something like that. They said yeah. they'll, they'll they'll give you a special grease. <laughs> Yeah, it's a special grease or something, but yeah, yeah. The astrophysics mounts can can take a lot. The biggest issue in Michigan is is the rapid temperature drops throughout, like in the evening. But then that just requires focus changes. That's about the biggest. We issue. have the opposite the opposite problem here, the exact opposite. Because huh. uh, in the summer, uh, it can get up to forty five Celsius. Oh wow! Yeah. It Ow. gets really hot and it stays hot throughout the night as well. Um, so I keep my stuff outside in a plastic shed, uh, not an observatory, just a regular garden shed. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had any issues, but uh, I have friends who have had problems with, you know, uh, grease becoming liquefied and leaking everywhere and you know uh, stuff deforming because of the heat uh it can get really brutal in mm -hmm. the summer here yeah. and obviously uh, uh another major problem uh, is 
getting rid of uh, all of all of that thermal energy stored inside the telescope throughout the night. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a major headache. Oh yeah, yeah. I think inside my dome because it's a plastic dome, it's not metal, and I've gotten up to about a hundred, so about thirty-five Celsius inside. But still, that gets it's hard to deal with. Yeah. We have a roll-off roof here in town, a 12 by 12 roll-off roof, and it gets pretty hot in there, but we, we installed a, a new fan and the yeah. two solar panels. We haven't tried the second solar panel we just put on because as soon as we put that on, the temperature just went phew. So, yeah. uh, so hopefully that'll keep a little cooler in there in the summer because it, it gets pretty hot and the observatory in the summer too. Mm -hmm. yep. Have you found that the warmer temperatures produce steadier seeing is that um so what happens is um it's it's not uh, it's not a result of the temperature being higher it's it's uh it's a result of uh just what the climate is doing during the summer for mm. this area so uh in the summer, it's also because we're an island. It's also more humid, mm. um, and because the summer season is very much extended throughout the year. I mean, we have like eight months of summer. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, the 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 climate here is pretty much stable at high temperatures for a long period of time. So it it tends to give better seeing conditions, but it, it's not because of the temperature. It's because of the summer being so extended. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do you take care of uh, any moisture or dust that gets onto the mirror? Uh, your best bet is to let it not do that, to get a uh, good dew prevention system. There there are plenty of places that sell you yeah. know sell stuff like that, Thousand Oaks or Kendrick. So, yeah. so your, your, your best bet is to never let do get on your optics if you can help it. Yeah, astral systems. Yeah, my, the, new, the reflector I got, the secondary, has a, 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 a heater on the back. It just, it's set so it, uh, when it gets the dew point or the, yeah, the dew point gets within a couple degrees, it turns on automatically. So there's a bunch of devices out there for all sorts of different types of scopes. But yeah, that's the best way. Don't get it on there. Yeah. <laughs> I okay, mo <laughs> moving on here. I just wanted to mention real quick, uh, since we're half past the halfway point for uh, winter here, is you know I'm, I I always try to think way ahead, so I'm looking for any ideas for you know uh, astrophotography sig events during our off season because you know we'll uh, we won't hold meetings uh, you know and probably definitely uh, uh, June, July, and August. So there's plenty of stuff we can do. We can do special workshops. We could do, you know, uh, planetary uh, workshops. Uh, we, we can fly uh, Agapios in. I'm sure, I'm sure that'll be cheap. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe we'll, we'll get some pointers ahead of time. But yeah, we can do planetary stuff. We can do lunar stuff, either just with a DSLR or a planetary camera. Uh, we can do, of course, deep sky stuff. We can, you know, of course, we can set up at Al Observatory and use our equipment there. Or if you want help, uh, learn how to do imaging there are plenty of people in the club that can help you with that so we, we can do workshops at the nature center we can do workshops at say richland township park or something like that so i'm just looking for interest because you know we didn't have a lot of participation in the lunar workshop that we did last year so if anyone is interested in any uh astrophotography workshops you know let me know agapios are you interested yeah, I just, I'm going to throw something in and then I'm going to leave you. Um, uh, you know, Mars is coming up again. So when the time comes, uh, we can do like a live remote viewing uh, from here. So I'll log in and I can, you know, show Mars and we can do some live capturing and processing. Oh, that'd be great. Oh, yep. great. Uh, yeah, we could think yep. about something for December, January, because that, that's like roughly the best time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll, we'll kind of roughly put you on the calendar now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. And All right, of course, so- um, I want to talk about imaging trips. Oh, yeah. So again, th- th- thanks for joining us, Agapios. It was fantastic thanks, ha- having you here. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. Be well. Sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> So aside from workshops here in town, we could do uh, imaging trips. Uh, uh, Dave Garden isn't here again. We're, we're, we're going to have to hunt down Dave and uh, beat him, Pete, because he's uh, skipping stuff here. Yeah, I know where uh, he lives. <laughs> but um, Dave Garden has, you know, some dark sky property up in the Manistee Forest. He can't have too many people up there. There's not a whole lot of room. So we could maybe have a limited uh, imaging trip up there. You know, we've been talking about doing that forever, but various things have gotten in the way like uh the weather and covid and stuff like that uh but uh they should have room for at least you know at least half a dozen maybe a dozen but you know power is the one problem um but i don't want to uh mention it uh, more until uh dave's here to talk about it but uh you know th- there are other places we could travel to i've been wanting to go back to uh, cherry spring state park for a long time that's a really good spot to do imaging, and they have uh, pads for telescopes. They have electricity. They got lots and lots of stuff at Cherry Springs. Now, I haven't been there since 2005. So, um, again, uh, you can uh, pipe up now. You know, Do you want to do some workshops, imaging trips? Or if, if not now, uh, email me, and we'll uh, work on it. But if there's no interest, I'm, I'm just not going to bother. I'll just do my own thing. Where is uh, Cherry Springs? Cherry Springs is in uh, north central Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. It's a, a dark it, site. D- it's, dark a, site. it's a dark sky site. Oh, yeah, okay. it's very dark. Yeah. I'd definitely be game for uh, imaging trips, especially around New Moon. That's yeah. New Moon. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah. But um, even if it's off site, um, wherever, wherever that would work out, I can provide power. I got. A generator built in my truck that provides clean power. So, great. It's like, um, is, is there anyone interested in uh, chasing uh, northern lights, uh, no, no, aurora borealis? When, whenever there is something, uh, whether someone is interested driving up there? Possibly, yeah. It, of course, it depends on schedule and. Yeah, solar it, activity, short, but, but hopefully here pretty soon we won't have to travel very far. Yeah. So, yeah. It, within a short notice, right? Like uh, they predict, uh, okay, it's going to be there. Yeah. It's like I like call up and go, hey, let's go now. Yep. <laughs> That's, yeah. It depends on how, where it's at. I mean, really it's a matter of getting out of the, how far someone's, I guess, willing to go. And if it's down this way, just get out of this, into the dark. We've had some good ones down here, but yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, hopefully the solar cycle gives us a lot of opportunity. Oh, okay. But yeah, you know, if there's, it's, it's always a last minute thing with stuff like that, so it's hard, hard to organize. But uh, you know, Arya, if you're ever heading up north and want to put a call out, just let me know. I can send something out to the membership. You know, some someone may want to go. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of people out there. Uh, Let's see, uh, just a quick mention of the KAS Remote Telescope. Uh, I was hoping uh, I would have an action shot here. Oh, no, here here he goes. Uh, Henry is using the scope tonight, so it's in the uh, home position. So he's not imaging yet, but uh, the last I checked here, it was uh, parked and the roof was on. But uh, Henry has it in the uh, home position, and he's getting ready to image. So we do have the remote telescope there available for use. I just want to keep reminding people of that. We have the 20 inch uh, plane wave. We have the four inch Takahashi with two fantastic CCD cameras, uh, full frame, very sensitive under the darkest skies, you know, uh, basically in the continental US, much better than anything we have around here. And of course, um, I still need to contact. Um, uh, uh, Bob Denny about seeing if we can modify our shutdown script. So what you can do is, you know, if we can get it set, you can just click a box to, to shut down your imaging run when you're done. And, you know, the scope will park itself, turn itself off, the roof will roll on while you're sleeping. So I'm hoping if we can get that done, uh, maybe more people might use the scope because you don't have to be up to, you know, put it to bed and anything. You, you, can, you can just let it go, uh, especially if you know you're going to have a good night. Sometimes it's uh, iffy 
out there. But I uh, just want to mention that. And also after the online viewing session season is over, uh, we're going to try to send the Takahashi in to get it collimated because it definitely needs uh, to be collimated. Uh, and, and as usual, Owl Observatory is available for imaging. Uh, you know, the Nature Center isn't the darkest site, but you can still do some pretty good deep sky imaging from the Nature Center. We got a, you know, fairly decent uh, camera for imaging. Uh, but of course, you can do planetary imaging. And one of the things I was going to try to get here uh, by the spring or summer is a uh, more suitable planetary camera. We can use our ZWO ASI 071 for planetary, but I wanted to get a more dedicated planetary uh, uh, camera like what Pete has there. So we'll, we'll very likely get something like that. So because uh, again, one thing I really want to do this summer is lots of H alpha uh, uh, um, mm -hmm. imaging. I, I watched a couple of really uh, interesting YouTube videos on H alpha imaging. They had very different approaches. You know, one person took a long shot for the prominences and a shorter shot for the disc and combined them, which is, I think, what like Roger does. And then another person just did it all in one one image. And so, you know, everyone has different techniques and they come out differently. So I, I I want to get out there and, uh, you know, uh, practice at Owl Observatory because we have the Teleview 101 with the Coronado 90 filter. And once we get a better camera, I think we can do some pretty spectacular uh, solar imaging. Of course, we can do lunar imaging, planetary imaging, uh, all from Owl Observatory. And um, besides, I, I'll mention uh, next month's meeting. But uh, let me copy and paste some stuff here from my clipboard. I know a lot of our guests have uh, abandoned us already, but uh, let me post a lot in the chat here. So in the chat, you can see I have uh, registration links for the last online viewing session of the season. The last one is February 26 at 9 o'clock. So if you, if you have not joined us for an online viewing session, of course, we take, you know, quote, live images with uh, both telescopes out there, the Takahashi and the plane wave. So, you know, we get to look for, you know, look at fresh images of the sky. Uh, I, I try to uh, give you some background information about them, both historical and scientific. And basically, it's just a place for people that love astronomy to, you know, uh, hang out and, you know, talk about it. Cause that's what we, that's what we love to do. We have our general meeting on March 4th. Our, our guest speaker will talk about uh, mainly the Voyager program. We've never had anyone really talk about the Voyager program before, at least since, since I've been in the club. And then of course we have uh, part four of the lecture series on February 26th, which is on telescopes. But I specifically wanted to mention here for the Astrophoto SIG is the very last part of the lecture series, part five is called the art of astrophotography. And so uh, I'll mainly focus on the really basic type of astrophotography, you know, like tripod photography, but I'll briefly touch on the other types as well. But of course, I won't go into as much detail on planetary imaging as what you saw tonight. So I spend most of my time on the basics again and then just sort of briefly introduce you to everything else. Uh, so that'll be on March 12th is the art of astrophotography. And so, of course, you can register on the website right now, but probably for probably for the last two parts for sure. I'll probably just send out the webinar link uh, to members. And so you don't really have to register at this point. Um, cause of course, if you have not attended the first three, you have no chance of getting a certificate and, you know, some people really, really want it. Some people could care less. So for the next Astrophoto SIG meeting, uh, we have David Churchill, who's, uh, well, I always want to say he's a resident at Arizona Sky Village, but he actually has an observatory there, um, so David Churchill is sort of our neighbor at Arizona Sky Village. And uh, more recently, uh, teaming up with Fred Espinac, who also lives at Arizona Sky Village, or actually lives at Arizona Sky Village, they uh, have a, a plane wave, a 17-inch plane wave, and I think a four or five-inch astrophysics refractor uh, down in Chile. So, you know, that is the ultimate type of remote imaging where you get to use a telescope in the other opposite hemisphere where you can see stuff that we can't see at all uh, from here. So uh, that's what uh, David Churchill will be talking about next month. I'm sure he'll talk about his stuff at ASB, but 
I'll kind of remind him, I think we're more interested in hearing about the stuff in Chile because that's what, you know, that's what we would love to do. You know, if, if we had the money, hell, I'd move the remote telescope to Chile or Australia, you know, overnight. Uh, hell yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, we will go ahead and adjourn. So thank you everyone for joining us for the Astrophotography SIG meeting for March 2022.